I want you to think global, to treat the Earth as a whole in its relationship to its environment in space. So here goes. We know that increase in the concentrations of greenhouse gases raises the efficiency of the insulating envelope and reduces the net global radiation. If you look at those red little arrows pointing out that says the radiation we give out into space from the Earth just balances the radiation we receive from the sun. And that balance is what maintains the conditions for life. We reduce the amount of radiation going back. That means that temperatures start to rise at the surface. And that means provided there is just a single step increase in greenhouse gases, then slowly, as the temperature goes up, radiation goes out again, and we recover equilibrium. Sadly, it's not like that. We have accelerated the accumulation of greenhouse gases. It's not just a, a set step increase. It's going up exponentially. So the radiation levels are decreasing. So the heating is increasing. Oh, and by the way, feedback dynamics are also pushing the system even further for out of balance and pushing us towards a hotter and hotter Earth response. Now that's the phenomenon we're going to look at in depth. So here we go. Problem, feedback dynamics and the acceleration of climate change. Ready to go? Okay, we're going to change the way we look at it. Let's look at what actually makes climate change happen. And here we have, um, we're used to this, aren't we? Increased carbon dioxide concentration drives the heat engine. You know, scientists call it radiated forcing. That doesn't translate into anything that most of us understand. They know what they're talking about. I know what we're talking about, but most people don't. Radiated forcing is global heating. It's the heat engine that drives the change. The temperature is the outcome of the heat engine. It's like you have a big cauldron of water on your gas stove. You turn the gas up, that's the heat engine. The thermometer goes up slowly as a response. Right, this is the gas light. That's the, that's the thermometer. So, increased carbon dioxide drives the heat engine. So does methane concentration drive it. Other greenhouse gases drive it. There are effects from aircraft Condensation to the contrast to the aerosols, the particulates in the atmosphere, they affect the heat engine. So, of course, does the reflection from surfaces on the Earth, particularly snow and ice, savanna, desert, the difference between water and trees, a mountain. And then finally, the cloud effects, which are so difficult to model. Light reflects from the top surface, but clouds tend to act as, a, as an extra blanket and keep you warmer as well. So they go both ways. And it depends on the height of the clouds, whether they're ice particles or water droplets and the thickness of them and the size of them. It's an immensely complicated modeling area. The energy that comes in from the sun is the driver, and there are some, obviously, that's what helps the, the heat energy. Uh, there's a small amount of energy from what we call geothermal energy at the center of the Earth, which provides a little heating at the surface. But it's very small, and we can ignore it for the sake of today's work. Okay, so that's what drives climate change. Now we bring in the feedback processes. What we've done here is create a series of clusters, a series of clusters of feedback. Each cluster is driven by one particular uh, phenomenon, effect in the climate behavior, and has its own effect on a particular field of behavior. So for instance, the cluster feedback group one is driven by increased concentration of carbon dioxide and affects the increase in carbon dioxide. All the rest are driven by temperature, a bit like this. So there we have the cluster F1 driven by and affecting on carbon dioxide, all the rest of the feedback processes are driven by rising temperature and then they in turn act 
on the driving processes that turn the heat on, which puts the temperature up, which in turn drives the drivers, which puts the heat up, which puts the temperature up, which drives the drivers, which puts the heat up, which puts the temperature up, and we have a global feedback process. What do I do? Now we could look at some of those in detail, and back behind this presentation is a three-day seminar, so I'm going to be a little bit briefer than that this morning. But we could quite briefly look, for instance, at the methane cycle. And here we have methane that emerges from human activity, from plants and animals, bacteria, and methane released from store. That summed up gives the methane emissions, increases methane concentration in the atmosphere. In the atmosphere, methane slowly breaks down into carbon dioxide and water vapor. Carbon dioxide adds some CO2 stock, but the methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas and puts the heat engine up and puts the temperature up. Now there's a feedback cluster in the methane cycle which operates like this. It's driven by temperature, and the warmer the temperature gets, the greater bacterial activity and the increased methane production. This we already see. More methane production, more global heating, temperature goes up, bacteria love it even more, more methane, but we've got there. That's what feedbacks are all about. The next one, tundra permafrost, those great areas of the icy waste with fossil ice left over from the last ice age deep underground and the surfaces, which just thaw a little bit in the summer and freeze again in the winter. Today, they are thawing deeper and deeper and deeper. We have an area about the size of France and Germany combined in Siberia now engaged in quite rapid thawing. And in that permafrost are trapped deposits of methane and deposits of the biological material which the bacteria then get out and we get release of methane. More methane goes out, more heating, temperature goes up, more thawing, more methane, and so forth. And then the really big one there is about three times the amount of hydrocarbon energy stored in methane clathrates, as they call them, the frozen lattices of methane stored in the shallow seas at appropriate temperature and pressure conditions. Three times as much hydrocarbon energy in that methane store as in the total store of coal, oil and gas combined. That's a lot, a lot of energy. As the seas start to warm with global warming, that methane can start to release. Oh, it's not going to happen for decades. You don't have to worry about this. Well, actually, NASA reported in a confidential email to me in February 2007 that the first methane class rate release had been detected off San Diego in October of the previous year. But please don't pass this on because the Bush administration might not be too pleased. Last December, and in the, uh, and in the months that have followed since, we know that the NASA satellite monitoring has shown plumes of methane coming up from the shallow seas of the north of Siberia as the clath rates in that continental shelf begin to move decades ahead. Hmm. We have already activated the methane bomb, as they call it, but it's a slow burn. The oceans warm very slowly and mix down to the, to the, to the seabed, and then the methane comes up, and then the temperature slowly responds to that. So it's a slow but inexorable cascade feedback process. 